Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Anthony Chafee. I'm here today with a very special guest, Professor Ben Bickman of BYU. He is a uh, PhD professor, uh, lecturer, and scientist in uh, metabolic health and uh, very, very knowledgeable in uh, all the science behind how your body works. Uh, professor Bickman, thank you so much for coming. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much. You're very welcome. Um, just so just so that people get a, an idea of uh, who you are, they haven't come across your things, which I fully encourage people to find your videos online um, and follow your Instagram page, which also has very, very interesting, uh, you know, quick videos to talking about various subjects, which I, I find very, very useful. Um, could you tell us a bit about yourself and, and your research? Yeah. Yeah. So I am a husband, father, and scientist. No one ever wants my parenting advice, so I'll just go right to the science. Um, but yeah, I, I, I became an interested during my uh, PhD in, in the mechanisms of insulin resistance. I was looking at insulin resistance as the time, at the time as this connection between these two diseases I was interested in, or, or two states maybe to be a little more accurate, obesity and type 2 diabetes. And I looked at insulin resistance and still do as the great mediator between those two. Why is weight gain so coupled to type 2 diabetes? Well, insulin resistance is what's connecting it. Um, and, and my, my view on how insulin resistance connects a fat cell to other, to other things has expanded, where it's not just type 2 diabetes, it's also infertility and Alzheimer's and more. Uh, but my interest has stayed quite firmly in insulin as a hormone. And uh, my view is just unique. And, and the, the drum that I'm pounding that I want people to hear is that insulin isn't always our friend, that while it is a hormone that is needed for life, it is also pathogenic when it's too high for too long. And that's, that's really formed my research to this day um, during my postdoctoral work and then now as a, a principal investigator with my own lab over this last decade or so. It's continued, uh, the work has continued looking at insulin, its effects pathogenically or harmfully on the body, and also other things that ins insulin influences like the production of ketones and how ketones um, uh, act as their own signaling molecules and not just as a nutrient source, but actually telling cells to do something. And just to state that another way, because it is unique, um, where it's, these are not just nutrients. You know, ketones have a caloric value, similar to about glucose, actually, but they also have signaling that is very unique. They almost act like a hormone. Now, they're not, but they kind of act like it. Uh, anyway, I've gone a little too into too much detail as an introductory sort of statement. But yeah, that's my focus is metabolism in a big sense. And then in a narrower sense, it's, it's some of the differential effects of insulin and ketones in neurons, in muscle cells, and fat cells in particular. Yeah, that, that's, that's very interesting. Um, very, very interesting. I, I think that um, you were the first person that I've heard talk about hyperinsulinemia as, as, a, as a driver of disease in and of itself, uh, as opposed to you know, high blood sugar, obviously, which can cause its own damage. But in yeah. response to this, you have uh, hyperinsulinemia, which which you, know, you have uh, been talking about as, as this just, just itself uh, can drive disease. Um, what are some of the things that you found with just you know, the, the effects that, that uh, hyperinsulinemia causes in, in regards to uh, you know, obesity and diabetes and, and, as you say, Alzheimer's? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it is very important. Too many people don't realize <clears throat> that hyperinsulinemia is a fundamental aspect of insulin resistance, that they'll hear me or you or anyone else talk about insulin resistance. And that immediately evokes this idea of it's a state in the body where the hormone insulin isn't working well. That's true, but it doesn't stop there. Insulin resistance is a coin and one side of the coin is the fact that the hormone insulin isn't working the same way that it used to at some cells of the body. In other words, some of the body's cells are in fact insulin resistant, like muscle cells or fat cells, but other cells of the body are perfectly insulin sensitive or have some mix of insulin sensitivity, like liver cells or, or gonads, like ovaries in particular. And, and that all becomes relevant when we flip the coin over this coin that I'm calling insulin resistance. The other side of the coin is the hyperinsulinemia. You cannot have, um, this is such an important concept and it's misunderstood by a lot of low carb folks. There is no such thing as insulin resistance without hyperinsulinemia. That's very important because there are some instances 
called physiological insulin resistance, where the body has become insulin resistant to serve a valuable purpose. And overwhelmingly, that's growth. And that's why you only have physiological insulin resistance in two situations, pregnancy and puberty, because those are the two periods of rampant growth in a human, in the adolescent or in the adult female, of course. But even still, it's rampant growth in the insulin resistance and the connected hyperinsulinemia help to fuel this selective growth in the adolescent or the pregnant woman. But regardless, whether it's harmful insulin resistance, like I study in my lab, the kind that's connected to Alzheimer's, et cetera, or whether it's physiological insulin resistance, when the bodies become insulin resistant for a period of time on purpose, it still is both of these aspects. It's insulin is altered in how it's working and blood insulin levels are elevated. In other words, hyperinsulinemia. And a perfect example of this, Anthony, when we, when we look at these two sides of the coin, it's to look at the two most common forms of infertility in males and females. Specifically, I mean erectile dysfunction and polycystic ovary syndrome, respectively. And in erectile dysfunction, it's a problem of the insulin resistance part of this coin, side of the coin, which is that insulin isn't able to promote sufficient vasodilation in the man anymore. And so not only does he have probably elevated blood pressure, but if you can't dilate blood vessels, you don't have normal erectile function. And thus it's the insulin resistance that's contributing to the male form of infertility, the most common. In stark contrast, in the female, it's not the problem of compromised insulin signaling. It's more a problem of the hyperinsulinemia because at her ovaries, she has cells in her ovaries that are capable of rapidly converting testosterone into estrogens. And that's a little known fact. All estrogens were once testosterone and the ovaries convert that over very, very well at a much higher rate than the testes do in men. However, insulin inhibits that conversion. And so as she's insulin resistant and her insulin levels are higher, that has a specific effect at the ovaries where it's the elevated insulin, not the insulin resistance per se, that is preventing her ovaries from converting the testosterone into estrogens at a high enough amount. Now her testosterone's too high, her estrogens are too low, and then she has polycystic ovary syndrome. She isn't ovulating, she may have more coarse body hair, and so on. Yeah, I think that's 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 one of the things that uh, I, I've certainly noticed in in my patients and, and just the populations that go onto a low carb diet or especially a carnivore diet is that it really overhauls their hormonal health as well. And and you know, sometimes we think of it as just getting enough cholesterol because obviously you know cholesterol is, is a precursor for estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, yep, yep. and so forth. But um, that you know it, it is is. Uh, really a secondary point to, to what you're talking about is because, you know, if you, if you have this hyperinsulin mixed state, you, you, you can have all the cholesterol you want. You still won't have enough uh, estrogen in women. And so yeah, um, that's exactly that, right. Yeah. And that, and that, that is something that I've noticed as well. I, I didn't know the mechanism, but I've, I've seen polycystic ovarian syndrome uh, actually reverse uh, going on these elimination diets, especially a carnivore diet. And, uh, and I, I did not know the mechanism. So I'm very happy to, to, yeah. to hear that. Yeah, but, but Anthony, so you see this though, like firsthand, mm -hmm. what I envy in the physician is that you guys are where the rubber meets the road. You get to be the one who actually sees this change directly. The fact that you have a patient who does this and mm -hmm. you see the insulin levels drop, you know, in Australia, maybe it's 80 picomoles and it goes down to 20 picomoles. That is absolute proof positive that yeah. the person is more insulin sensitive than they were before. But you have some individuals in this space who will say that, well, a low carb diet or a carnivore diet, that's going to cause a physiological insulin resistance. Absolutely not. What they confuse, and I'm sorry to veer off, but I'll promise I'll just be a second on this, but I think your audience may enjoy it uh, or appreciate it, if not enjoy it. Uh, it what does happen is that when someone is, has adhered to a low carb or zero carb diet for an extended period of time, they, 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 uh, the pancreas is too efficient to hold on to insulin when it doesn't need it. Mm -hmm. And so what could happen, Anthony, you could have a patient come in and maybe they're adhering to a standard kind of Australian diet, which is like the American, you know, it's kind of high carbs and they would drink a glucose solution 
then you could measure their, do an oral glucose tolerance test. And you see that the glucose comes up and it comes down in a pretty nice normal, maybe, it not, maybe it's not great, but it comes down and it looks okay. They go on super strict, let's say carnivore for six months. If they were to come right in from scratch and take that same oral glucose tolerance test, they're gonna do worse. Mm. And that's not, and some people will say, well, it's because they have physiological insulin resistance because they're ignorant and they don't know any better. So we, we pardon them for their ignorance, but it's not a matter of compromised insulin action. It's not insulin resistance. It's just that when you've been avoiding carbohydrates for an extended period of time, even if you fast for a full 24 hours, and we know this, this is well documented. If you're going to do an oral glucose tolerance test the next day, even fasting for too long, your beta cells of your pancreas start looking at all of this insulin that they have preformed, packaged and ready to go. And they think we don't need all this stuff. Let's start breaking down all the insulin that we have preformed because we just don't need it. It's taking up space, if you will. Now I'm being a little silly, but that's kind of the way the beta cells looking at it. And so when you suddenly get this rush of glucose in a system that's not expecting it, you lose what's called the first phase of insulin secretion. So normally when you challenge the body with glucose, you'll see one little phase of insulin and then a second bigger phase that lasts a little longer than before coming down. The first phase is all of the prefabricated insulin that is on hand, packaged up and ready to go. The second phase is all of the insulin the beta cells start making once they get the signal. So they push out all the packages that they've already made. Then they've turned on the machinery. The factory is turned on and now they start making new insulin and start releasing it just as quickly as they make it. But it's that first phase that the beta cells are thinking they don't need anymore. And then when you just rush the system, again, this even happens after if a person has fasted too long, um, you know, around 20 hours or so, they start to lose that first phase insulin response. Well, that means you'll have a harder time clearing that glucose. Mm. And so it looks like you've gotten, a, a, well, a, a positive result. In other words, a negative, a negative sign, a bad test, because you look at this and think, well, gosh, you've, you can't clear the glucose as well. Well, yeah. it's just because you've lost that first phase of insulin temporarily. All a person would need to do, if, if there were a carnivore adherent who knows they have to go in to do an oral glucose tolerance test, just prime the pump a little bit, get those beta cells making more insulin and holding onto it, you start eating a few more carbs the days before you go in, then you'll go in and you'll pass it with flying colors. You just have to remind the beta cells to put a lot of insulin and hold it to make a lot of insulin and keep it on hand for when they get challenged with this rush of glucose, which is something they're not used to. To say it all another way, even though I've already gone too long, Anthony, pardon me, oh, no, but please, it's please. To, to say it another way, it's almost a reverse metabolic inflexibility. So people have heard of this concept of metabolic flexibility, which is a body that can shift between glucose and carbs really well, or glucose burning and fat burning rather, I mean, really well. The average individual, because they have chronically elevated insulin is essentially stuck in glucose burning. Even when they start to fast, which should shift their body to fat burning, they don't, they stay in glucose burning. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're a carnivore, it's almost like you're stuck in fat burning and the body has a little bit of a reluctance. You've lost a little bit of that flexibility. Now, I wouldn't say that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's fine. If you're gonna be anywhere, be in fat burning mode, but it does make it a problem if you come dump the body with full of glucose, well, it takes a little time to shift back. It's a little resistant. It's a little inflexible. Now, thankfully you can go back to perfect flexibility after like a day, eat some carbs one day, the next day you're right back to where if you want to be there, well, that's where you are. Now, again, I'm not saying that that's something healthy or, or needs to be done. You know, that's some people might hear what I'm saying and then think, ah, oh, well, that's why I need to cycle in and out of carnivore or ketosis. No, I'm not saying that, but for the sake of transparency, it is almost like you have this opposite form of metabolic inflexibility, whereas the average person is stuck in glucose because their insulin is chronically elevated. The carnivore, if you will, is stuck in fat burning because their insulin is chronically low. Mm -hmm. Now I say stuck, of course, they can get that right back to, you know, perfect flexibility if that's what they want after just a day of just snacking on some carbs. Yeah. I was, I was actually going to ask you about what, what your thoughts on uh, the whole idea of metabolic flexibility was. I, I think people say, well, well you need, if you're on a carnivore diet, you need to incorporate fruit and honey because you need to, you need to maintain your, your metabolic flexibility, which never really tracked with me. And, and, but you know, no. you're but yeah, just so you don't, you don't lose that at any point. So if you were, if you were a carnivore or keto for a number of years, 
you know, would you be able to snap back into it if you needed to? Within a day. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Yeah. yeah all, really, all it takes is one challenge to the beta cells. And then they say, ah, okay, we're doing this again. No problem. I can do that. Yeah. And probably, you know, they, since they've been rested for so long, they're not going to be, uh, they might be even, even more ready to go. And uh, yeah. whereas, it, you know, sometimes you can get, you know, a type two diabetic, you can burn out your beta islet cells and, and uh, now become insulin uh, dependent. Uh, which happens yep. uh, to quite a lot of people more and more. Um, it sounds like the the, the insulin um, relationship and response sort of sounds like a bit of like tolerance to like like drug or alcohol tolerance, where you have this this buildup in, in different uh, different sort of enzymes to, to to you're anticipating your body's anticipating this uh, this, this toxic. Uh, exposure and you're, and you're trying to sort of mitigate that and be ready for it. It sort of sounds like the, your, your body's doing that with insulin as well. It, it understands there's, there's just going to be an abnormal amount of carbohydrates coming in, which, which can cause harm, hyperglycemia uh, causing, you know, glycation, mm -hmm. uh, it damages your body. And it sounds like, uh, it's, it's sort of preparing for that in, in a sort of a tolerance, uh, mechanism. Yeah. I thought, well said, I, I wouldn't have said it any better myself. Yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned uh, erectile uh, dysfunction as, a, as an inability for the for the body to uh, you know dilate the the vessels. I, I've also heard you talk about that this this could be uh, implicated in high blood pressure as well. Is that right? Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yes. So um, they're very common in that regard. Insulin tends to have when insulin is working, it has a vasodilatory effect. Um, it's one of insulin's lesser known actions, but it's just further proof that insulin literally affects every part of the body. Every single cell of the body has insulin receptors, which really makes it really unique among hormones because not all hormones, in fact, few hormones do that. But one of insulin's effects is when it binds the cells of the blood vessel, it will induce the production of a molecule called nitric oxide. And nitric oxide, I'm sure your audience knows, it's a potent vasodilator. That's basically what, if someone's experiencing chest pain, they go in and they give them nitroglycerin. It's because the nitroglycerin will help stimulate this nitric oxide throughout the body, and it will throw open the blood vessels, for example, of the heart, and then the chest pain goes away. But to another degree, that's what's happening around the body. But in the case of the insulin-resistant man, when his blood vessels have become insulin-resistant, well, that's not working as well. And so insulin's trying to promote vasodilation, it can't, and the blood vessels stay constricted. Now, systemically throughout the body, as the vessels are more constricted, the narrower that volume is, of course, the higher the pressure goes. Those are inversely related. As volume's dropping in, this, in the chamber of the blood vessel, it's pressing in on the blood more, which increases pressure. But then, of course, when it comes to erection, if you can't dilate the blood vessels and they stay constricted, now you have a compromised will compromise erectile function. And, and this, in fact, is so, uh, it's such an intimate connection, if you will. Uh, scientists have suggested, and, and physicians, that erectile dysfunction may be the first clinical sign of insulin resistance in an, undiag in an otherwise undiagnosed man. Basically, if there's a guy who has erectile dysfunction, it might be worth testing his metabolic health, namely his insulin and insulin resistance, to get an idea of whether that might be the source of the problem. And if it is, well, that's good news because we can start to fix that pretty quickly. Yeah, and 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 that's the thing too is we, we don't we don't commonly look at that, or at least you know doctors mm -hmm. I know don't commonly look at that. They often will look at that as a, as a as a sign of low testosterone. I test know, I know. Yeah, and um, yeah, but that 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 makes perfect sense. Um, you were talking about uh, ketones acting as as signaling molecules. That's actually something that that's new to me. Uh, can you go into a little more depth with that? Oh, yeah, for sure. I'd be happy to. So let me just cite some other people's work first, and then I'll get to mine. Um, and nothing a scientist likes talking about more than his own work, right? Like a dad who wants to brag about his kids. Uh, so so other people's um, kids are cute, too. And so other people's research matters, too. And, and one group found that ketones actually will bind to cells and inhibit um, something called the NLRP3 inflammasome. And whenever you hear the term, like nowadays people attach an ohm onto everything, you know, it's metabolomics, the microbiome, all, all this ohm. Ohm as a suffix just generally refers to like a sum, like the entirety of whatever it is you're looking at. Um, and, and so the inflammasome essentially evokes this idea of, of something that is in charge of all inflammation. And that's not too far from the truth. Um, where th this molecule NLRP3 
essentially, if it's activated, it will essentially turn on all of the machinery to produce all of these pro-inflammatory cytokines and initiate immune systems throughout the body. Now, of course, we need a healthy immune system, so this can't be viewed as a bad thing, but you want it to be turned on when it's supposed to be turned on and turned off when it should be turned off. One of the problems with obesity, or even, even not overt obesity, but just fat cells that are getting too big, even if the person's just modestly overweight, is that they become pro-inflammatory. And this is why weight gain is associated with a, a, it's sometimes called a subclinical inflammatory state, where it's subclinical because it's not like the person's coming in with some raging fever, but in fact, the inflammatory markers are higher than you would expect in an otherwise healthy person. So in these instances where you have kind of aberrant activation of the immune system, and inflammation, which is something I've studied uh, extensively um, in, in my, my postdoc work and, and even in my current lab, uh, it's, it's valuable to know how can we turn that down? How can we turn down this aberrant inflammation? And ketones will do that. Uh, mm -hmm. When ketones, and this isn't because of their energetic their, or their caloric value, it's because they can bind to these things called G protein coupled receptors. And anyone, I know, Anthony, I know you've heard of these. Anyone who's gone through any kind of biochemistry would remember, if, if only painfully, learning about G protein coupled receptors because they are everywhere yeah. and they signal all kinds of things. But there are so many different types um, uh, that ketones will bind a particular type and in so doing, act at like a hormone binding this surface receptor, just like a hormone does, initiating a series of events that result in the inhibition of this key inflammatory signal. And so that's one example where, again, I'm citing someone else's work. It's, it was a fascinating study. Mm -hmm. My work has found, we've specifically looked at the signaling capability in fat cells. And we found that when ketones come to fat cells, including fat cells in humans, that it starts to activate an uncoupling process at the mitochondria. Now, now briefly, um, all that means is basically the ketones result in the mitochondria and fat cells um, being much more active. It basically stimulates the metabolic rate in the fat cells by about two or three times um, over normal. And again, that's not because the ketones being burned for energy. Mm -hmm. It's because they're once again, is a G protein coupled receptor on the fat cell that is, that is activated when ketones come knocking. And then that tells the cell to do something. But, but I, I hope I can impress upon the audience just how cool that is. That yes, ketones are an energy. That's why, you know, the brain so greedily pulls in ketones because it has an energetic um, value. It has a caloric value, roughly similar to glucose, you know, about four calories per gram. But independent of that is its signaling capabilities, which, which is just like the cherry on top of the low carb cake, where this is, it's really, these are molecules that again are an energy source, maybe desperate for the brain um, or the brain becomes desperate for it. So it's a very good viable energy source, but also a good and viable signaling molecule that provides an anti-inflammatory and even dare I say metabolic benefit. Yeah, well, that, yeah, that's, yeah, that, that's very interesting. I didn't know uh, any of that about ketones. That's fantastic. Um, that, that's one of the things um, as well. You know, people talk about you know, in, when you're in ketosis, they want to they maintain that, that state of ketosis and they get very concerned about their ketone levels and exactly what's going on there. Um, and a lot of people will be concerned about eating too much protein and they have their protein mm. like their insulin and, uh, and cause a problem there. I... You know, I, I haven't really seen that be a problem. You know, when I think of things from a carnivore perspective, I just think that, you know, this is, this is just physiological. This is how your body's supposed to work. You're supposed to eat this stuff and, and whether or not you're technically in or out of ketosis, uh, you, your body's still going to be running physiologically. But, you know, what, what do you think about the whole too much protein, uh, blood sugar, insulin spike? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that you're asking this uh, in, in part, of course, because I have a lot to say, but uh, <laughs> this is something that I have a, a personal history with. When I first became, and I'll, let me just share it briefly, because it's interesting. Oh, when I first kind of became aware of the low carb community, when my lab had started studying the effects of ketones on fat cells, and in that very first early work from my lab, one of the organizers of a low carb event, it was called at the time, low carb Breckenridge, and these guys reached out and said, hey, we, we can't, we're aware of what you're doing. We'd love for you to come give a talk at our meeting. And this was the very first non 
science meeting I'd ever spoken at. You know, it was just a lay meeting, like they do low carb Melbourne, you know, low carb Sydney, you know, whatever, low carb down under. Um, uh, you know, you have these meetings around the world of kind of low carb enthusiasts just from the community at large. And so it's a lay audience. This was the very first time I'd ever given a talk to a non academic at a non academic venue. Um, and, and I loved it, frankly. Um, but it was uh, that was my first exposure to the, the, the community and the kind of keto community at large um, coming in as a scientist. And I was so interested by what I saw and heard, which was a fear of protein, to your point, where people were saying, oh, well, I saw, you know, they were like, they were drinking oil uh, and, yeah. you know, adding butter. And I thought, this is so bizarre. Yeah. And then I, and, and a lot of it was born from this fear of protein, which itself came from the original ketogenic diets that were used to treat epilepsy. Right. And, and it was such a, uh, it was such a necessity to keep the person into deep ketosis that you didn't want to mess with that at all. You didn't want to do anything to potentially blunt those ketone production, the ketogenesis, lest they have an, uh, an epileptic seizure. So a tremendous reason to want to be in strict, strict, deep ketosis all the time. Well, the fact is insulin can, uh, insulin can increase in response to dietary protein. That can happen. And if insulin goes up, well, then ketogenesis or ketone production will drop. Yeah. But I nevertheless thought it was tremendously a, a misplaced fear. And then the next time I spoke at this same meeting, that was the topic I spoke on. It was basically helping people understand the fact that they need not be afraid of any modest increase in insulin that comes from dietary protein. Because if it happens in the context of a low-carb diet, then the commensurate increase in insulin's opposite is glucagon namely is at least is greater than or equal to what the change in insulin is and that matters so in other words if you eat some protein and you're eating it with carbohydrate which in nature never happens in right. never in nature protein comes with fat it doesn't come with carbs but in our you know in our hubris nowadays we've mixed the two thinking we know better than god but nevertheless if you eat your protein with glucose then you get a big increase in insulin bigger than it would have been if it was just glucose alone so no question, the protein adds to the insulinogenic effect of a carbohydrate. But also, they're not supposed to come together. If you eat the protein with the fat and there's no carb, well, then there may be a modest insulin increase, but there's a relatively greater glucagon increase. And glucagon is insulin's opposite in many, many ways, including ketogenesis. So whereas that little elevation in insulin is trying to inhibit the production of ketones, that relatively greater increase in glucagon is overcoming that and in fact, acting more as a, stimulate, a stimulatory effect. So offsetting the modest increase in insulin. So the, to wrap all of that up, my concluding thought is for the average individual who's, who's focusing on just improving their health, no reason to fear protein, but be smart about it. Don't eat your protein with carbs because you will in fact amplify that insulin effect. Eat, let, the, let the protein come with the fat that it wants to come with in nature. And if you're adding anything to it, let it be that you're adding a little olive oil or a little butter or whatever, not carbs. Rather, add a little fat if you need to, because that fat will not increase insulin. We are going to publish our own paper soon, and we have studies, and I'll, you know, I'll, reveal, I'll let the cat out of the bag a little bit. We're doing macronutrient challenges, and you have to eat hundreds and hundreds of calories of pure fat before you're going to notice an insulin effect. If it's in the realm of even like 300 calories, which is still pretty significant, that's the range we're using, not a single blip. Okay. The insulin and the C-peptide don't budge at all. Um, but anyway, to bring this back to your original question, no reason to fear protein. That is how we're supposed to eat fat. Um, you know, in nature, that those two come together and let's just eat them the way God intended, if you will. Yeah, I completely agree. And, you know, I, I, I find the, you know, the mechanisms extremely interesting, but I also try to keep sight of the, of the big picture, which is this is how we evolve. This is what we evolved to eat. And so whatever is happening, it's supposed to happen. And so you can, you can just let it happen. You know, nature is natural. It just happens, you know, uh, things have been set into place and you can just, you can just let them go. When we try to micromanage our, our blood sugar or micromanage our ketones or micromanage our, our body's pH, like you're going to run into trouble. Your body knows how to do this yeah. a lot better than you do. And, um, you know, I, I like, I always like hearing, um, some, especially some of the early proponents 
of or, or people discussing a, a ketogenic diet that that you know, weren't scientists or were mainly more influencers or you know, phys- you know physical trainers, personal trainers. And they would they would talk about these things that, and they'd sort of look at the studies and maybe not quite quite get them and like mispronounce mm-hmm. big words, which is always great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and um, and uh, and you know, and then talk about how you know ketosis is uh, is like well you know you're you're tricking your body into thinking it's starving to death and you get the benefits of starving to death. It's like wow okay so it's like apparently there's the benefit of starving to death you know yeah and, it's such it's so it's so moronic yes it's so funny like I remember hearing it from from one guy and I was just like and I got so upset I was just like you tell me one re, one benefit of starving to death except you're now dead and I don't have to listen to this stupid crap anymore <laughs> and, and um, you know but they talk to, you'll talk about tricking your body into thinking it's starving to death it's like I'm sorry it's just silly. You yeah. know, in fact, Anthony, if you'll allow me to riff for a second, the mm-hmm. irony is that if you're producing ketones, you're not starving. So the wow. difference between fasting and starvation is have you run out of fat? And then yeah. the moment you run out of fat on your body, now you can't make ketones to feed the brain. Because when you're fasting, the brain mm-hmm. is producing about is, uh, ketones are providing about 70% of all of the brain's energy. And so its glucose need is very, very low, which is good. Um, because if you're not eating anything, you know, you're going to, especially carbs, well, then it's nice that the brain's glucose demand has gone down. Once you start running out of fat, your production of ketones plummet. And now the brain can't get any ketones and has now become totally dependent on glucose. Mm. And guess who has to start paying that? Well, it's muscle. And so now you start stripping the amino acids from the muscle in order to make all of this glucose for the brain to eat. So the irony is, they say, well, ketones, it's like you're tricking your body into starvation. In fact, ironically, having ketones means you're not in starvation. You're fasting. That's the difference between a fast and starvation. Do you have enough fat to make ketones to fuel the brain? Then it's a fast. Even if it's a 380-day fast like that fellow did in Scotland or Ireland or Wales, I think it was Wales actually, a documented fast of over a year. He, of course, was morbidly obese. It was under medical supervision with water, minerals, vitamins, etc. But the fact that he kept making ketones meant he didn't lose any muscle. And indeed, he didn't because you don't cut muscle unless you're starving. And starvation happens when you run out of fat and you can't make ketones. Right. So yeah. that's the irony. So not that guy yeah. was a double moron. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, but yeah, but that's the thing. It's just like you know, you're you're not you're not going to be that smart. You're not, you're not out thinking, you know, nature and how how the yep. the, the world works. Like you're just not that smart. And if you if you were smart, you would look at this and be like, okay, well, this is a natural process. Let's try to emulate it as close as closely as possible and and and, and achieve optimal health that way. Um, yeah. Well, in fact, Anthony, just to be fair, if you're smart, you probably wouldn't call a guy a moron. So I'll, I should temper my language a little bit. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I, you know, again, like, it, you know, what you said before, you know, we, we can forgive them in their ignorance because, you know, you know yeah. some people are trying to just suss this stuff out. Um, but it, you know, it, it does, it does sort of, you know, make, make you frustrated sometimes when you, when you see people commenting on the, these, uh, you know, these systems that, you know, that, that, they exist in a textbook. Like you can read these things and, uh, and you can understand them. Uh, you know, they, if you want to do the work, but you know, people say, Oh, you know, it, like it's the old saying, a little bit of information is a dangerous thing. Um, they, they get a small piece of this. They think they understand, uh, the entire picture and, and maybe they do, but likely they don't. And, and, you know, Thomas Sowell, you know, one of my favorite authors, uh, said, Oh, now you're talking my language, man. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, you know, he says it, it, it takes a lot of knowledge to uh, understand just how ignorant we are. And, and I, you know, I noticed that firsthand when I was in medical school, I got about halfway through my second year in medical school. And leading up to that, I was, I was just, you know, so, so excited about all the things I was learning and understanding, like, wow, I really, I've got a lot of control over all these sorts of things. I know about this thing and this thing and this thing. This is this is so great learning about how the body works and about how to you know, treat diseases. And I got halfway through my second year of medical school, and and it just sort of I felt like I was I was building up to a crescendo, and all of a sudden I was I got to the top of this hill, and I was able to see out of this vast mountain range of things I did not understand and know. And I it, it was very humbling, and I just looked at that and went, okay, I need to just sh- you know shut up and and read for a number. Yeah, of- yeah, yeah, yeah. Well said. I just I just don't. I don't know enough yet. 
and uh, and so that's um, unfortunately not everyone gets to that point <laughs> that they, yeah. they they sort of see like wow I, I really don't know enough about this. Um, that sort of that sort of uh, leads me to my next question, talking about you know the optimal uh, energy source of the brain. You know, when I was taking biochemistry, you know, 20, 22 years ago, we we were taught it was ketones. You know, that your brain optimally runs on ketones. It pre preferentially runs on ketones, especially when you're in a in a so called fasting state, which I I argue is not a fasting state. I argue that that's our primary metabolic state. Mm -hmm. That's the metabolic state of most animals in the wild. If you look at them, yeah, that's our natural state. Our natural state isn't energy. putting something in our mouth. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and specifically not putting carbohydrates in our mouth and, and, and getting into a hyperinsulinemic uh, state. Um, but that, this is, this is something that people talk about that, that, that glucose is the brain's uh, primary yeah. energy source. What, what do you say about that? Yeah. Well, yeah, of course. I, I love this. In fact, it's very, very timely. I just got back from a meeting where I presented um, at a, a science meeting, and it was it was the, the meeting of the American Association of Biological Anthropologists. Now, the acute listeners in the audience are thinking, anthropologist? Bickman's not an anthropologist. I'm not. I don't study human evolution at all, and I'm so grateful that I don't have to focus my career on a theory, and that I can focus on just hard, cold facts. But even still, I was so intrigued that they would reach out and invite me. And I felt compelled to remind or inform the person reaching out to me, I am not an anthropologist. I didn't add that I, I'm glad I wasn't, but, uh, but I, I, I just felt compelled. Hey, look, I'm a nutrient biochemist, you know, mitochondrial physiologist. What, what, do, you, what do I have to say? And, and he had said, I'm, aware, I'm familiar with your work on brain energy use. I am putting together a session and, and it's all about the changes in human diets over, you know, our ancestor diets. Um, over these periods of evolution, uh, and, and I want you to talk about the brain acting as a hybrid. And in my preparation for this talk, I found uh, a paper that had been published in like the most dynamite anthropology journals, the Journal of Human Evolution, I think it was called. I, I don't really remember, but it's their really great journal that everyone wants to publish in. And in that article, I found two, it was all about how the Neanderthal diet and the development of the brain. And they had two comments in there both of which reflected a profound ignorance by stating that d dietary carbohydrates are essential and were essential to our ancestors mm. in the development of their brain. And I actually cited that article, and then I just kind of hopefully tactfully just said, this is wrong, um, and, and then shared with them a quote by the National Academy of Sciences in the U.S. stating that the lower limit of carbohydrates in the human diet is zero. Yeah. In other words, there is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. And the whole the idea that the human brain evolved because our ancestors ate a lot of carbs, that's utterly ridiculous. And that's basically the impression I gave the audience, hopefully not too offensively. But I had many, many people come up to me afterwards, very, very grateful. Um, maybe the, the haters and the detractors didn't bother coming up, but no one said, no, no one uttered a negative word. It was just absolute gratitude at learning this reality of human biology and physiology, which is that, yes, it, it's because they mistake dietary carbohydrates with blood glucose. That right. it appears, what does appear to be the case is that the brain has some demand for some glucose. That appears to be accurate, although the lower limit is unknown early work by a, a fasting physiologist named George Cahill, he was putting people's glucose down to like 20 milligrams per deciliter, which most people would say, you're unconscious, you're in a coma and you're going to die. And these people, because they'd been long-term fast adapted, which I would say ketone adapted, there appeared to be no deficit to cognition. I mean, that's a pretty bloody low level of, of glucose. But nevertheless, let's kind of grant that side of it that the brain has some requirement for some glucose. Well, it is a minimal requirement because if you take a body that has five millimolar glucose and you start increasing the ketones to one or two or even three millimolar, which is still less than the five millimolar of glucose. So there's still less of the ketone in the blood than there is the glucose. By then the brain has already dramatically shifted its energy use. And even though the ketone may be less than half of what the glucose is in the blood, it's now providing double 
you know, twice as much of energy to the brain as the glucose is. So if the brain has any preferential fuel, it is absolutely for the ketone. And even further, it's the closest I can come to kind of human or anthropology at all, and I don't want to get any closer, is what we see in infants. You can take a newborn baby and the baby can breastfeed or bottle feed. And then within an hour, the baby is in a deeper state of ketosis than an adult would be after fasting for, 20, uh, for, for a full day. I mean, it is, it really, that baby will be a two millimolar ketones in an hour. And an adult, and for me, if I want to get to two million, I got to fast for like 36 hours to get to that point. You know, and, and I mean, so if, if there's any natural state, kind of back to our conversation a moment ago, it is clearly that a natural state is a state of ketosis. And, and I think even more, and I'll flirt again in the waters of anthropology, I'll dabble my toes, um, but it's, it's reflected in humans. We are such totally unique creatures where we are the only land-based mammals born obese and the only animal who has a brain that is larger than the birth canal, much to mother's chagrin. But that means we have these very big hungry brains and all of this chubby, adorable baby fat that is just producing ketones like gangbusters to fuel the brain growth. And if you have a baby that is born premature and lacks sufficient adipose tissue, it is much more likely that they're going to develop neurological disorders. All the more reason to chubby up that baby as quickly as you can. Wow. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. And we, and we do see this in, in um, uh, you know, working neurosurgery and uh, you know, we get a lot of premature babies that have quite a lot of problems and, and that come around with uh, being just a, a premature child and, and neurological issues and neurodevelopmental uh, delays as well. And that can, that could certainly uh, explain much of that, that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, that that's another thing too, you know, people, people talk, I, I remember reading, um, something that uh, an article that uh, probably in one of these, these anthropology journals, uh, a friend of mine sent me when I was, when I was first doing this, they said, Oh, well, you know, look at this study. And I think like her cousin had actually written it. Um, it was, it was all about honey and how, they, how they're arguing that honey was probably the causative factor of our brains growing so big because oh it, it, it's the most nutrient dense is most calorically dense substance. And my initial response was like, do you know what the word density means? You know, I know, it's, it's, I know. You know it's calories that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. It's like, just stay in your lane. Yeah, you know, exactly. you, you, you anthropologists and, and in all, and in all seriousness, they were incredible scientists and I was thrilled to meet them, but clearly there's just this bit of a disconnect. I shouldn't say stay in your lane. That's part of the fun of academia. It's going out of your lane for a moment, but mm. to make that kind of statement about honey, yeah. look, I'm not trying to declare war on honey. I know that in the carnivore community, there are some very outspoken advocates I think it's clear that our ancestors, our hunter gatherers, it's clear that if people can get honey, they're going to love it and they want to eat honey. But to then say that that was a, the like fundamental food and brain development, well, the brain isn't made of honey. You know, yeah. The brain is made of proteins and fats, especially a lot of fat. Mm. I mean, and you need these essential fats from meat in order to have sufficient brain growth, you don't get any of those from honey. And I'm not trying to declare war on honey, but to say that that was an essential, uh, that it was a necessary part of our ancestors diet, that to me is just silly. Yeah. Well, and also, you know, you know, you know people obviously like the Inuits living in uh, by the North Pole or, or our ancestors coming through the ice ages, you know, there was no honey and, yeah, and there was right. no fruit. And so, you know, I, I'm certainly in the, the other side of the camp where I'm saying, you know, honey's actually really bad. <laughs> is bad for you. Fruit, fruit can be bad for you. Fructose, you know, Dr. Lustig from UCSF has done yep. yeoman's work uh, showing just how harmful uh, fructose is. But then some people say, well, in the context of, of honey in this, you know, in, in you know, and, and fruit, you know, maybe it works differently. And, and, and that may be true, but they haven't actually provided any evidence that it does. Uh, and so in, until that research comes out, uh, you know, I'm still going to be uh, you know, erring on the side yep. of, of caution and, and avoiding uh, fructose. Um, that was another thing too, you mentioned being ketone adapted. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, of different um, thoughts and, 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 and confusion on when exactly we become ketone adapted when you want to go into a carnivore diet or even a ketogenic diet. Um, you know, at what point is your body optimally running on ketones and uh, and providing the the requisite energy for physical activity or or especially like endurance athletes will always ask me how long do I need to 
uh, you know, do this before I'm, I'm ready to go for my, my big uh, marathon? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. Unfortunately, that'll probably be the one question I can't answer authoritatively. Um, because I'm just not enough of an exercise physiologist and I've never seen a study that has looked at the temporal adaptation, you know, like take a, per, a person from day zero, have them start adopting a ketogenic diet and then monitor performance, you know, watch it go down and then how quickly does it come back up, mm-hmm. which it would, it absolutely will follow some kind of curve. You will have a, a, a reduction in performance and then it would go back up, especially for endurance. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know, but maybe I'll, so I don't appear to be totally ignorant. Uh, let me share some other thoughts briefly on it. I actually think when someone's getting to elite level competition, I, I think that they're, I can see the justification for using carbohydrates in performance, like Zach Bitter, the, the, that incredible runner. Um, I believe he will train and live essentially zero carb, but when he's really performing and during high intensity training, he will use carbs. And, 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 you know, in his words, it's like a, it's just a, a rocket fuel. It's like an extra fuel. So I do think for those who engage in very high intensity activity, I could, I could be easily convinced that there is a value to dietary carbohydrates, even in the low carb adapted athlete. But I know many, especially endurance athletes who don't flirt with that kind of stuff at all. And even in the midst of their Ironman, they're still all in full low carb keto and they do great. I'm just saying I could be convinced. It wouldn't take a lot of evidence for me to say, yeah, that makes sense. Um, Where if you're tossing in some glucose in the midst of it, you're going to use that glucose and and you're going to use it greedily. Yeah, I I certainly noticed, um, you know, because I I played uh, professional rugby for 10 years before I went to to medical school. Five years of that, I was on a carnivore diet because when I when I I sort of first came upon a carnivore diet simply because I, w- I was studying uh, in cancer biology and, and uh, botany, just how toxic plants were. These things uh, are living yeah, organisms yeah. and they, and want, they want great. to stay living organisms. And so when I was- In saying, fact, I remember, I heard you say something about, you saw, you had a professor who basically said plants yeah. are trying to kill us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it, yeah that was, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That was my, my cancer biology professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. And, you know, he just, you know, this is something that I actually remember learning in, you know, seventh or eighth grade biology was that, you know, plants and animals are in an evolutionary arms race, plants becoming more and more, more poisonous so that less and less animals can eat them so they can survive and thrive. And then animals becoming more and more adapted to specific poisons and specific plants so they can eat that plant. And and that's their, that's their, uh, you know, designed plant that they can eat. And that, and that becomes a, uh, you know, a, a, a dedicated food source. They don't have to compete for resources as well. So this is, this is very advantageous to them, like a koala, like a panda. Um, and, and so we were looking at it from a yeah, cancer perspective and, you know, he was, he was showing that, you know, 20 years ago, 22 years ago, uh, that, that, um, you know, Brussels sprouts at the time had already, they'd already found 136 human carcinogens in them 22 years ago. And that like white mushrooms had over 100. And then we were literally given a, a, a handout with just pages of just every single plant and vegetable that you've ever eaten, every, every edible, so-called edible plant. Yeah, and yeah. They, they, not a single one had less than 60 carcinogens in them. And, uh, you know, Professor Bruce Ames from Berkeley in 1989 published a, a large paper looking at the comparison between these natural poisons and the pesticides we spray on them, uh, specifically ALAR that was used for apples. And because they were trying to ban them, they were trying to ban all the pesticides in, in the 1980s saying these, these are toxic. And he was like, okay, yeah, they are. But that's literally the point, you know, you know what insects eating these things, but we've been using these, these for 80 years. Like, why would they be causing a problem now? And he showed that there were 10,000 times more naturally occurring poisons in, in the plants like spinach and mushrooms by weight than the, the pesticides we were spraying on them and that wow. they were orders of magnitude more likely to cause cancer in animal models than, than the ALAR that they were studying. So that's why we still have ALAR and other, other pesticides. Yeah, so they justify it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that's the thing, you know, because when you were looking in the context of the plant that you're eating, the plant itself actually contains worse components. And, uh, and, and, and this is the entire, you know, you know, uh, idea behind GMO foods. You're, you're taking, uh, you know, a plant that can make a toxin, that will kill all these different sorts of bugs 
uh, but you know, maybe corn doesn't have that. So you take that out, you put that in the corn. Now that corn is protected from many, many more bug species. This increases crop, crop yields. This, this, you can grow this in, in areas around the world that maybe wouldn't have been able to. And this is, is, is quite beneficial. That's the idea. And, and it saves on pesticides. But what you are doing is you're making it more poisonous. And, uh, and we know from inedible plants, they will just kill you or make you very, very sick. That, that is a common theme throughout the plant kingdom and, and the fungi kingdom is that they, they use, because they can't run away or fight back like an animal can, they need to use these sort of chemical deterrents to protect themselves. And yeah, and so our professor was going through that and we were just blown away. And even though we had learned this in seventh grade uh, and he's telling us this and showing us the evidence of it, that, that whole, you know, you have to eat vegetables, salad's good for you, even though it's bitter and disgusting and uh, you don't want to, uh, is, is coming is coming to bear. And I remember thinking in my head, I was like, but, you know, but vegetables are still good for you though, right? And he, yeah, he just looked at us and just said, I don't need salad. I don't need vegetables. I don't Dude, let my- this guy, good for him. It was great. And, and he just said, he's like, he, he's like, I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you. I'm like, right, screw plants. And I just, I just stopped. And, you know, I, I went to the store and I just, all I bought was eggs, meat, and milk because everything else had plants yeah. in it. And I just I ate that for five years. I was, you know, I was playing rugby, you know, at quite a high level. I'd, I'd been an all American. I was, I was playing in the, the um, BC premier league. Actually, we, we, we would go up to like Vancouver, Vancouver Island uh, all the time mm -hmm. with my team in Seattle. We played in the, the top leagues in, in America in the super league. And then I went and played professionally, um, uh, you know, in, in England as well. And I was doing all-star all uh, competitions and, and, and um, as well. I was doing this on a pure carnivore diet without realizing it. I just knew that plants were trying to kill me and I just didn't want to touch them. And my performance as, 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 a, as an athlete went to all new heights. It was absolutely insane. I was able to train so much harder, so much longer. I got so much more out of it. I didn't get sore anymore. I couldn't get tired. I got to a point of, of, of fitness that I, I literally could not get tired. I could not push myself hard enough for long enough to get tired. I would, I would train, I would be in university at University of Washington until three o'clock. I'd go straight to training at 3.30 and I'd be training with rugby uh, until about nine o'clock. And then I'd go to the gym. I could not get tired the whole time. I would play a game yeah. for the University of Washington. I would play a game for Seattle. And then I'd, I'd jump in on the seconds games as well. Sometimes I was playing four games a weekend because I just wanted to play, 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 play. And I couldn't get tired. I could, I, I could not get tired. And I remember thinking that, that I should just like, just enter a marathon or something like that, because I could literally, literally just yeah, sprint yeah. the whole thing. And I was like, I was like, that would be, I just wanted to, just to get on record, just how insanely fit I was and, and just like, you know, just blow out some, you know, uh, some marathon, yeah, some scrawny little marathon runner. Yeah. yeah and it just, it just blow Taking by his it. gel pack, his little goose yeah, yeah. slapping out of his hand and like, get yeah. out of here. And, uh, you know, but, uh, it just sounded like it pretty, pretty boring. Honestly, I just didn't want to just, just run yeah, for extended blame of time you. without, you know, like what, if, if I'm, if I'm running more than, than 40 yards, like I, I'm hitting somebody. <laughs> yeah. You're done. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just, you know, I'm just, I'm just, I, I just got to tackle somebody like, that's just not worth it to me. Like I need some sort of just, just physical conflict at the end of it. Um, but so probably wouldn't be safe to put me in, in a marathon, but, um, yeah. but that, that was it. And, you know, and I think about, you know, think about it biochemically and, and, and relaying this into, uh, you know, so, some sort of, you know, layman's terms of, um, you know, getting a runner's high, you know, getting your second wind. A lot of, a lot of endurance athletes and a lot of just athletes in general have certainly heard about this and, and some have experienced it where you, you push yourself, you're exercising very, very hard or you're running great distance and, and you eventually run out of energy and you hit the wall and you feel awful. You just, you just like, that's it. You're cashed out. Most people stop at this point if they even get to that point. But then there are, there are people that have, have, have pushed themselves and pushed themselves and pushed themselves. And then eventually they break through the wall, they get their second wind and then they can just go forever and they feel, and they feel amazing. What I think is happening there biochemically is that they're in this, this, you know, hyperglycemic insulin driven state. Uh, and 
so you know insulin is 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 stopping your body from from mobilizing your energy from your fat and so you're going to have blood sugar you're going to have liver glycogen and muscle glycogen that you're going to be running on and especially if you carbo load and that's why they do that um, but eventually you're going to run out this is a finite resource whereas in in, in studies we've seen in wolves in 1981 because they said, you know, you need to burn, eat carbs or burn carbs. They said, well, wolves don't carbo low before they chase caribou for 10 hours. You know, do they have, do they even have blood sugar? Do they even have glycogen? They found out, yes, they do. And it's rock solid. It doesn't change. Their body's constantly replenishing it. And so when you're eating carbohydrates, exogenous carbohydrates, that's going to curtail that. And that's going to stop that process. And now you're going to run out of energy. And normally it takes something like 16 to 24 hours before your insulin comes down low enough that you can actually start uh, producing more of your own energy. And then, you know, and, and that's, that's usually it for everyone. But if you push yourself, push yourself, I would imagine what's happening here is that you're actually forcing yourself to get back into uh, a state where you can, you know, uh, mobilize ketones, make your blood sugar, make, make more uh, liver glycogen. And then you, you just get into this this, this, uh, runner's high yeah. and this second one steady you state. Go, go forever. Yeah. Whereas I think about it, if you're in a, in a ketogenic state or, or a carnivore state, you're, you're always in that you're living in that second when you're living in that, uh, um, you know, you're living in you know, past the wall and you can just go forever. And so even now when I'm in my, my forties and I started this again, when I was sort of 37, 38, when I got back from uh, Bangladesh doing humanitarian work, I found that you know, I felt a little crummy. I was, you know, I, I'd put on extra weight and, uh, and I was trying to get back in shape to, to play rugby again. And uh, I just wasn't feeling great. Then two weeks on a carnivore diet, I was still, you know, pudgy and, uh, and not in shape, but I felt amazing. I could now, I could now run. I could now work out. I was, I was lifting for three, four hours a day. I didn't want to stop, you know, because the more I pushed myself, the more energy I had, the more energy I burned, the, the better I felt, the harder I wanted to work. So it was this positive feedback. And then when I started going back to rugby, you know, after a couple of weeks of this, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting back in there. I was able to run at a dead sprint, push myself uh, very hard with all these professional athletes in Seattle with the major league rugby uh, team there, the Seawol Seattle Seawolves, who was my old team that I grew up playing with. These guys have been training very, very hard for all the months that I've been away in Bangladesh and, and before. And I had not, and, but I was able to keep up with, with, with everyone and be a, just a dead sprint the whole time. And I, again, I, I didn't get tired. I didn't run out of energy and I didn't get sore the next day. And so I, th I think that for high performance athletes, especially that this is, this is very advantageous. Now, I don't, I don't know exactly when you get into that yeah. the keto adapted uh, state, but I do know from, from my experience, it, it didn't take long before I felt a thousand times better than, than when I wasn't doing that. No, I mean, and, and, and even, even kind of contrary to what I had said, you, and, and, and like Sean Baker, you know, these guys who are yeah. just performing at super high intensities, it's not like you need to be spiking in carbs to do it. Hmm. Yeah. And, 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 and that's how I sort of feel like I, I, you know, I've spoken to Zach, Zach's, Zach's actually a really cool guy. I was actually, um, back in 2018, I was on with, uh, Dr. Baker mm -hmm. and Zach on their original podcast, the human performance outliers podcast. I was one yeah. of the early guests on there. Um, and, and I remember talking about that and about how he was very low carb, but he would use some carbohydrates for his, um, for his, uh, competitions, which is like, look, he's, he's found a system that, that works for him and that, and, and yeah. he's, you know, breaking and setting world records, which is, which is fantastic. But, you know, I, I certainly know for myself that I've, I never felt better athletically or physically than when I was on a, on a pure carnivore diet, actually, actually even much better than on a ketogenic diet. I wasn't specifically doing keto uh, this last time around. I just wasn't eating carbs, wasn't eating sugar, wasn't drinking alcohol. Yeah. And I was just having you know, a lot of green, a lot of greens, which I think was a problem. And then some meat, which is also a problem, not getting enough nutrient nutrients and, and, um, and I'm getting a lot of, of these harmful effects from the greens. And when I just stopped those and actually increased my, my meat intake significantly, I, I dropped like 25 pounds in about 10 days and lost a lot of water weight and felt amazing and started, you know, uh, my, my performance and athleticism just immediately spiked. Um, that sort of just leads me to, to another question. What this whole idea of calories in calories out, 
I think is, is, is outmoded for a lot of reasons, but even just my own personal example there, I essentially quintupled my caloric intake at that point. Cause I was eating very small amount of lean muscle, uh, muscle meat, and then a lot of greens, which don't have many calories in them. And I went for, to eating two to three pounds of fatty ribeye with butter melted on it a day. And so I was eating way more calories and yet I dropped weight and I felt better. What are your thoughts on the whole calories in calories yeah. out idea? Yeah. Yeah. So I think invoking thermodynamics in weight loss was one of the greatest tragedies of our understanding of, of, of human metabolism. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe even to put, say that another way, uh, looking at nutrients as calorie sources, I think is, is unfortunate because if, if we're looking at the calories, then we immediately develop a weight loss paradigm that is based on hunger, whether we know it or not. And when I want to kind of uh, show this to my students, I will cite, I will use this analogy and I'll say, imagine, in fact, and I'll tell this to the, to the, to the listeners here. Imagine if I'm having, I'm holding a buffet, a, a, a wonderful dinner at my home. It's a buffet and I'm invited. I've invited the world's best chefs and they're going to produce the best foods. They're going to make the best foods you could ever imagine. Come hungry. What would you do to come as hungry as possible? And always the consensus is two things. My students always say this, they would eat a little less in the days before, and they would exercise a little more. And I say, you're exactly right. That would help you come to this glorious buffet as hungry as possible. But do you see the problem with that? They just gave me this perfect two-step recipe to make hunger as strong as possible. That is the exact two things we've been saying for 50 years to help people lose weight. Mm -hmm. Yep, eat less, exercise more. That's a great way to be really hungry. And that means if you use those two same steps in order to lose weight, sure, you'll lose a little bit of weight initially, but hunger always wins and you're going to get off and you're going to gain it all back and then some. So a hunger, uh, to, to take this down kind of into my neck of the woods, you look at what happens at a fat cell and you say, I want to shrink that fat cell. You can shrink a fat cell through two different ways. I promise this is relevant. One mm -hmm. is low energy. If you deprive a fat cell of nutrients, it will shrink. Now, of course, there's a problem at the body, namely the brain, and that is that it's going to start to get hung push hunger and push hunger. Conversely, an alternative way of shrinking a fat cell is lowering insulin. Because if you lower insulin now, even if you're eating a lot, you can't stop the fat cell from breaking down its fat and leaking it out. So even if you're eating a lot and there's still fat coming in, it likely will not match the rate at which the fat is coming out in order to be burned. And even just purely caloric um, discussion, when insulin is low, metabolic rate is higher. So you, you, your metabolic rate does go up to the tune of about 300 calories per day. That's pretty significant. You know, that's like going out and running. I don't even know. I don't run five miles maybe or so. Uh, but this is some now all of a sudden you don't have to do it at all. It's just doing itself. And so, so, so that's one thing. Um, if you're focusing on a low insulin approach, it doesn't have to be a hunger based approach, mm -hmm. which is very valuable because you can't beat hunger. You got to be satisfied. Otherwise you'll never stop eating Two, when insulin is low, your metabolic rate is higher. So let's say you're eating more calories than your body needs. Well, that's okay because you're pushing out more calories than normal. And then third, when you're making ketones, you're also excreting ketones. And as I said earlier, ketones have a caloric value. And so if someone's in ketosis and now they're breathing out ketones or urinating out ketones, they are pushing out actual caloric loaded mm. molecules from their body. And these are calories that didn't need to be burned and didn't need to be stored. You just wasted them. So you introduce this kind of third avenue when it comes to the bioenergetics of the body which is just wasting energy where you're just dumping ketones out back into the atmosphere, if you will. And, and those are actual calories that used to be stored in your fat that you didn't have to exercise harder in order to burn them in your muscle. You just dumped them from your body. That is how determined the body is to reconcile energy when insulin is low. It's just thinking if insulin's low, the body is thinking I got all this energy and I just don't need it. I, or I can't stop getting rid of it. I can't stop spending it and I can't stop getting rid of it. Um, because, but that is because that's what insulin wants to do. Insulin wants to store, store, store. So it will slow metabolic rate and it will promote tissue growth. And that's not a bad thing. We need to grow. 
sometimes. You know, we need insulin. I'm not saying it's bad. We just don't want it to be high. And when it is high, we want it to be uh, very quick. It's acute. It's up and then it's back down. Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's the thing too, it's, it's a very good point is a lot of these people uh, with, with different sorts of diets and weight loss, uh, they are hungry. They're hungry all the time and, it, and it's not really sustainable. And, uh, and they end up, I, I think this is a, a major driver in, in uh, eating disorders and disordered eating, you know, bulimia and anorexia. And, and they just, they just get into this state. They have a very unhealthy relationship with food as well. Um, I think when we, you know, if you look at after the 1980s, when you know, uh, 1977, when the USDA declared that cholesterol caused heart disease, this changed how we ate, this changed how we approached food. And we had a lot of, you know, large rise in, in various diseases, you know, chronic diseases, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, obesity, autoimmune diseases, but also eating disorders. They all went on the rise uh, to a significant degree. Um, and that's, you um, you know, what I think of, you know, yeah, you can, you can lose, you can lose weight by, um, you know, by just starving yourself, but you know, like people in Auschwitz lost weight too, you know, it wasn't really, that's not, doesn't mean it's healthy. doesn't mean it was good for them, you know? And so I don't, I don't think that's a model that we, we should, uh, we should look to, um, emulate. Um, you, you mentioned Alzheimer's, but this, this is obviously something that's, that's so prevalent, so important for people as they age and their, their brain health. And, and obviously everyone was, is justifiably very concerned about developing dementia and Alzheimer's. This is something that, again, is, is, is very new. You know, about 50 years ago, 60 years ago, we just we did not see uh, the numbers and the prevalence of uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, this is something that people are calling type three diabetes now, um, which I've, I've certainly heard, but that I think that, that um, this, is, this would be something that, uh, that you would know quite a lot about, I would assume. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is an active area of uh, research topic in my lab now. Um, yeah, the, the classic view on Alzheimer's is that it was a disease of plaques accumulating in the brain. And that paradigm has started to fall out of favor insofar as we have a lot of drugs now that will reduce plaques and it doesn't help the disease. Mm -hmm. And we have evidence from humans, um, from cadavers, people who died with and without Alzheimer's disease, you know, people with no evidence of Alzheimer's disease, and they'll have a brain that has lots of plaques in it. And yet it didn't appear to uh, force uh, a compromised mm -hmm. cognition at all. And this is provided an opportunity for the metabolic view of Alzheimer's to come in which, uh, and there's long been evidence for this, and, and you'd mentioned this term type three diabetes, a more uh, people will use that term. I don't love it. I prefer insulin resistance of the brain because it's just more precise, but that's basically what it is. In insulin resistance, the brain has affected, the, the brain has become affected and it can't use insulin well enough to open up the glucose transporters to fuel the brain because glucose is a primary fuel. And some of that glucose uptake is dependent on insulin opening the glucose transporters. Well, you have a compromised glucose uptake, which means the brain, the brain starts to go hungry. And that matters because the brain has a very high metabolic rate. And if it can't get all its energy from glucose, now you have an energetic gap. That gap could be filled by ketones. However, in the same person who's insulin resistant, and not able to use glucose very well, they don't have any ketones because they're hyperinsulinemic. They have elevated insulin. And as you said, and we've mentioned repeatedly, insulin inhibits ketogenesis. And so the brain is swimming in a sea of glucose that it can't use. It's calling out for this life raft in the form of ketones that insulin simply won't let the brain get. Uh, and thus we're left with a hungry brain. Um, and there's evidence in humans to show that if you start to fill that gap with ketones, giving a person like a ketone ester, you do improve their cognition. They, mm -hmm. they do start to think better. Not that we've cured the disease, nothing, nothing so grand as that, but it, we've, we've helped tip it back a little bit. And that to me is a bit of a win in a disease where there are never any wins. Mm -hmm. And so my view on, in, on, on Alzheimer's is if you've already got it, if, if a, pay, a loved one already has it, try to increase those ketones any way we can. If we want to keep it at bay, keep your brain insulin sensitive and give it some ketones from time to time, you know, for goodness sakes let it have some ketones, which yeah. is a preferred fuel if there is any preferred fuel. Yeah. And, and just, and just bypassing that, uh, that insulin resistance is, uh, you yep. know, it is, it just makes so much sense. And it's, it's just a sneaky way of getting your brain working again. Um, That's right. 
And um, that, you know, that's, a, that's another thing too. You know, we, we've been, we've put everybody on a, on a low fat, so-called heart healthy diet. But as you mentioned, you know, the brain is you know, pr primarily made out of fat. It's, it's something like, you know, the solid components is about 70% uh, fat and 20% of those are just DHA. And, you know, so, and, and the, that doesn't exist in, in plants. It doesn't exist in, you know, nope. plant oils, seed oils. Um, and then you have the, the very long chain fatty acids, 20 and 22 chain fatty acids, which again, don't exist in plants. We were not very good at making them. We do make some and we, but we not enough. No, certainly not. Yeah. And so you have to get these from your diet, but we've been told since, since the night, late 1970s earlier, really, but officially since the late 1970s, uh, you know, the pretty can diet came out. My father was a big proponent of that growing up and we just, there was just no fat in the house. And uh, when I was growing up, which probably you know, curtailed our own neural uh, development and brain development, but every now and then my mom would get like bacon or like some fat thing and just sort of look at this, like, oh, are you supposed to eat that? <laughs> everything in your body was contraband. Just, yeah. yeah. Everything in your body was just like, it's just like, this is life. This is everything you should, should be eating. But you felt you were conditioned to this is gross. And, and you sort of feel, yeah. oh God, oh, I can't believe I ate that. And yeah. But thank God I, 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 you know, I did uh, succumb to my instincts a, a few times, um, and um, you know enough to avoid irreparable damage. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. It, poor it, little, poor little Tony. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, at least it was an extent, you know, because you know, I, I, you yeah, know, yeah. You know, we we look at our, you know, anthropologically, we look at the, you know, the size of brains ha has decreased. Oh, yeah. Recently, you know, like like I think like eleven percent since the agricultural revolution that's pure, that's not genetic, that that's purely environmental. And, and so yeah. uh, we, we all got robbed by a good 10% of our brains that this ours by rights. And, um, and that bugs me. But what bugs me more is that, you know, now, you know, people are, are just not eating fat. And, and I think the, their brains are decaying, and not able to maintain, uh, maintain and, and uh, rebuild their brain. Uh, to an extent that it starts to atrophy. You know, we have we have MRIs that you just have aging brains, and, and and they atrophy, and they get, you know, they get they get so much sh more shrunken down than than you would believe. You look at a, at a kid's MRI, it's just every every corner of the skull is just just packed and just stuffed in with brains, and and early adolescence and adulthood is the same way. And then it, as you go, your your ventricles, which are the spaces inside the brain that the, the cerebral spinal fluid flows around. Uh, or is formed in and then flows around. These are usually very slit-like in uh, adolescence and early adulthood, and then just they do widen and widen and widen, and then the, the you know the sulci and the gyri, the sulci, the the dips in between the folds of the brain, they just start widening and widening and widening. And you you look at this and it's like the actual mass of the brain has just decreased by such a degree. And when you think about how many billions of, of cells, of neurons are in the brain, like how many hundreds of millions or, you know, a billion or more neurons you basically uh, have, have just wasted away. That, that, that is, that is frightening to me. Um, and then, you know, I, I, and so that would likely be a combination of not getting enough energy to the brain to maintain it and also not getting, you know, sort of the requisite fatty acids to the brain what are your well are your... i can't i can't think i can't help but think this is also a contributor to the increased depression and anxiety we have in in adults yeah. and and kids and there are a lot that's multifactorial no doubt mm. but we also know that in strict adherence to vegan diets suicidality goes up depression goes up mm. neurological problems follow when the brain is deprived yeah. And now this, it could be coincidence. This is not my area of research. I'm just struck by the coincidence that we have a culture that is depriving the brain of its essential nutrients. And yeah. we wonder at this, this plague of, of depression and anxiety. Yeah. Well, you, you, but you're, you're exactly right. You know, because there actually have been studies in, and published in psychiatric journals, looking at e even, even things that is schizophrenia and different sorts of psychiatric Ill, Ill issues that this is actually benefited by putting people on at least a ketogenic or even, uh, you know, just an elimination diet and, and specifically with depression, uh, cholesterol, cholesterol has been, uh, implicated or at least strongly associated with, uh, um, depression and anxiety. So lower, uh, LDL cholesterol is associated with a much, with a much higher rate of depression. And, uh, interestingly enough, lower people with low LDL cholesterol and depression have a much higher rate of suicide. 
So this is something that psychiatrists are now uh, pushing their depressed patients to get their cholesterol up. And thankfully, this is this is sort of coming around. But there's still so many doctors, and obviously, you know, most most uh, you know people in the public, they still are in this uh, idea and mindset that fat is bad for you, cholesterol is going to kill you. Uh, but unfortunately, doctors are still thinking this, and it's just like this is this has been out. You know, the Journal of American Medical Association published in 2015 that this was a hoax, that this was bought and paid for by the sugar companies, that cholesterol was never even associated with, with heart disease. And, um, and uh, you know, and, and so this is, this, is, this is out there, but yet they're not, they're not um, looking at that. Um, no, no, it's a slow moving ship and it's taking yeah. time to turn around, but there are those of us that are on speedboats and we've already turned it around. Yeah. Um, Professor Bickman, I'm 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 conscious that you uh, uh, have uh, some time time constraints, so I, I'll um, just thank you very much for coming on. It's, it's been an absolute uh, wonderful conversation. I really appreciate uh, your time. Um, where can we find you? Where can we find uh, your work? And how do we follow you and support you? Yeah, oh, Anthony, thanks. This was great. I really had a good time. In fact, part of what I enjoyed when you were kind of going on about your experience in in your awakening about the dangers of plants, all, uh, the theme of so much of that was the power of a good professor. Look yeah. what it did. Yeah, so absolutely. boy, it motivates me. I want to put someone on the right path. Yeah. Um, I hope I am. So yeah, I, I'm. Um, people can, uh, I wrote a book about insulin resistance. Anyone who wants to learn more about it, go get that book available anywhere books are sold. It's called Why We Get Sick. And then uh, I also helped make a low carb meal replacement shake. Anyone wants to learn more, go to get health, hlth.com. And then lastly, you'd mentioned social media. I, I'm, I'm fairly active on social media, um, especially given my general disdain for it, but I appreciate it as a tool. Uh, but may, my kids will never have anything to do with it. <laughs> um, but people can find me mostly on Instagram. That's where I'm mostly active. And people can find me at Ben Bickman PhD. And, and it's usually just little, as you said at the beginning, just kind of little video snippets that give insight into the, the wonders of human metabolism. Great. Great. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll put in links for all of those things in, in the description as well for people uh, to find Professor Bickman. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate your time. And hopefully we can, we can do this again sometime. It was fun. I had a great time, Anthony. Thanks again. Thank you.